Thanks so much for attending and wanted to welcome everybody to our live EUS webinar for establishing an EUS program in your community hospital. My name, as Amanda mentioned, is Dr. Nathan Landisman from Grand Blanc, Michigan, and coming to you live from a very snowy day about 60 miles north of Detroit. I'm a partner in a seven-doc, single-specialty, private practice GI group, which runs a fellowship and am the only advanced practitioner within our practice. And I want to thank Olympus for this amazing opportunity to share my experience as we review the technology of EUS and how it can become a very successful component of your community-based practice. For some of you, this may be review. However, for most of our audience, this may be their first introduction to the technology of EUS. Conventional white light endoscopy only provides views of the most superficial lining of the digestive tract, while the addition of ultrasound affords visualization of all five layers of the GI tract, as well as surrounding structures. This provides an additional benefit of accurate, safe, and minimally invasive sampling with rapidly expanding therapeutic applications, making it an ideal alternative to exploratory and invasive surgeries. In addition, EUS offers superior image resolution and higher detection rates of small lesions compared to CT, MRI, and PET scans. As a result, EUS plays a leading minimally invasive role in diagnosing, staging, and treating diseases of the esophagus, stomach, proximal duodenum, pancreas, bile duct, liver, spleen, gallbladder, left adrenal gland, and posterior mediastinum. Beyond the multiple benefits I just cited, this technology is patient-centered and cost-conscious, which are two overriding themes of a successful 21st century medical practice. When you send elderly, debilitated, or psychologically burdened patients to other institutions for EUS, you can delay diagnosis and subsequent treatment, in addition to added complexity and cost of travel. Meanwhile, EUS in your community provides accurate, timely acquisition of diagnostic data, with opportunity for streamlined therapeutic intervention, yielding better patient outcomes and higher satisfaction scores, both of which are intricately tied to future reimbursement. Referring patients to other institutions for EUS also affects patient retention and inflates out-of-network costs. So if you look at the graphic in the middle of your screen and you look at your Newton's cradle, you have that red ball sort of taking off into the great unknown and either never coming back or when it comes back crashing into your network, possibly causes some financial destabilization. Alternatively, EUS in your community solidifies an in-network care strategy, supporting patients from time of presentation, during diagnosis and treatment, and throughout future surveillance, generating financial benefit along multiple service lines. What I'd like to do at this point is focus our discussion on how EUS develops from an idea into a successful reality in your community setting. Clearly, any innovative idea begins with an original thought, and the beauty of that process is developing that idea into reality through defined implementation steps of preparation followed by execution with the assistance of key players at your institution. Taking this idea even further, the concept of an EUS community has taken shape, which is essentially a patient-centered feedback loop. On the left side of your graphic, you have the clinical support side with the GI doc serving as the foundation, while the right is the industry support network. This cooperative effort serves to support the patient from all sides and underneath, utilizing your facility, practitioners, key clinical decision makers, and manufacturer with the ultimate goal of elevating the patient to a higher level of care. Once the idea of EUS has been planted, the first phase of implementation is preparation, which involves managing expectations of key players, both clinical and administrative, understanding their perspectives, and learning to communicate in a common language to highlight the downstream benefits of EUS. Not surprisingly, Expectations of your community hospital and associated decision makers parallels that of the EUS practitioner very closely. Your community hospital's goal is to provide a necessary product to its patients, while the EUS practitioner seeks to provide a necessary service. 
The community hospital has a hunter mentality for growth, while the U.S. practitioner has the same mentality for diversification beyond bread and butter GI. Your community hospital has constructed strong relationships upon the foundations of trust, reliability, and service, as has the U.S. practitioner with compassion for patients in need. As far as perspectives go, again, there is a close parallel between your community hospital and the U.S. practitioner. Your community hospital seeks market opportunity for expansion of clinical services, while your U.S. practitioner seeks to expand beyond general GI services. To get an EUS program up and running, though, your community hospital and EUS practitioner have to identify administrative and clinical champions to carry this idea through the necessary steps. On your community hospital side, I've listed the administrative champions who were extraordinarily helpful in my quest. These were our CFO, CMO, COO, as well as the heads of our occult care organization, as well as physician's health organization, in addition to my endoscopy unit manager. On the U.S. practitioner side, in addition to the same administrative champions, I've listed the clinical champions who are instrumental in carrying EUS through the necessary steps at my institution. These were our primary care physicians, oncologists, surgeons, hospitalists, as well as our GI department head. When examining market opportunity for your community hospital, multiple components support that decision. Location is very important and usually about 45 to 60 minutes away from another EUS facility provides more than ample opportunity for patient retention and future growth. In addition, the further away your community center gets, the larger its successful catchment area swells. If you look at the state of Michigan I provided, the, the graphic, the large star is my location in Grand Blanc. And you can see the centers spread out about 30 to 45 minutes apart with a tremendous amount of future market opportunity in the northern portion of the lower peninsula and throughout the upper peninsula. Strong primary care referral base assists our in-network retention called keepage and will support your new program with referrals in addition to preventing out-of-network loss called seepage. Managed care environment with the presence of the ACO PHO, or this new entity we're encountering called the Patient-Centered Medical Home, is a further gatekeeper capitalizing on cost savings and growth opportunities generated by EUS availability in your community. Endoscopic ultrasound as well as, as, well as endobronchial ultrasound are dual service lines that can develop at your facility out of this opportunity and have very, very similar equipment and capital investments that can satisfy both endeavors. Oncology and surgical specialties can benefit heavily from EUS in your community, especially if regional cancer center expansion is planned. When you examine market opportunity as an EUS practitioner, one is often asked if there's enough referrals to support a successful EUS program. What many are surprised to realize is that your community hospital has multiple surrogate EUS business indicators in the form of a robust imaging volume of pancreatic protocol CAT scans, MRCPs, and intraoperative cholangiograms. In addition, despite the fact that ERCP has transitioned into a predominantly therapeutic tool, it's still used in the diagnostic fashion at community facilities lacking the ability to perform US. Therefore, ERCP volume may also provide valuable insight into potential US volume. Furthermore, your community hospital undoubtedly tracks inpatient and outpatient tertiary center referrals for EUS and ERCP that could easily translate into your community hospital's volume, as well as a tumor registry of specific cancers that may benefit from further staging with the EUS. So in summary, all of these components I've listed can operate as surrogate EUS business indicators that highlight a readily accessible patient population that already exists at your community center before a single outside referral even arrives. Being armed with all this information is extraordinarily helpful because communication between your community hospital and EUS practitioner will have to address the issue of cost very early on. Now that cost is defined not only as initial sticker shock, but also investment of time and training that borrows from other successful ventures and personnel and an uncharted future for a new service line. And I experienced this firsthand as I attempted to encourage my first facility to invest in the U.S. during the financial crisis of 2007 to 2008. 
And despite my best efforts, I couldn't get the powers that be to see beyond the cost. <clears throat> now, had I been armed with all this information, however, I could have shown how initial cost can be easily overcome by potential revenue from your community hospital's existing patient volume, imaging, out-of-network referrals, and inpatient transfers. The volume of anticipated outside referrals, though, that are coming to you is a much harder number to predict. But my experience is that word regarding this technology spreads fast, especially with some of the tips we'll cover later. So this cost conversation very quickly becomes less defensive of the price by highlighting ways to utilize your community hospital's built-in EUS volume to generate opportunity that's proven profitable by capturing revenue from multiple service lines, such as pathology, radiology, oncology, imaging, and surgery. In fact, calculations of over $7,000 of net profit per EUS have been documented. Now that the green light has been given to EUS at your community hospital, implementation will enter phase two, which is execution. Now communication never stops, but really transitions toward an exchange of information regarding the EUS procedure and practice. Education is a vital part of phase two, not only as a marketing force to the general public and healthcare community, but also as an ongoing commitment to education made by the EUS practitioner to hone his or her craft. Perseverance is absolutely required because sometimes the flow of patients can take time. However, I tell you that your community hospital, referring docs, and any partners may be so excited for the arrival of your expertise and this technology that they may have been warehousing a notable number of patients for quite some time in preparation for U.S. Day 1. Lastly, portfolio refers to the ability of U.S. to be a feather in the cap of your community hospital and U.S. practitioner, which is an investment that can pay off with remarkable future success. The first vital step of execution is organization of materials and personnel. Equipment needs and wants, including your accessories, should be defined. Your endoscopy suite setup, as well as potential block time, should be established. Nurses and technicians trained. Anesthesia support, as well as block time, can be requested, as well as pathology support, which in my experience has been indispensable, uh, can be tremendously helpful. If you can have an in-room cytotechnician or pathologist available for something called ROSE, Rapid On-Site Evaluation, you can ensure adequate sampling and accurate diagnosis with the least number of needle passes. In fact, you may find one of your pathologists has a passion for pancreatic biliary or GI pathology, which can be a springboard to building a strong relationship that can even extend into tumor boards and other educational ventures. Lastly, your community hospital may or may not have the ability to analyze pancreatic cyst fluid, which is important to know before starting to build protocols for this. The second part of communication involves the art of taking this cutting edge technology and intricate disease states and summarizing findings and plan in a clear, concise manner. The U.S. practitioner benefits immensely from effective communication skills in this regard. A personal phone call can be extraordinarily powerful and builds an incredible doctor-patient bond. And patients still cite instances when I see them years later in which I call them personally. A lot of patients have never had a physician call their home, especially if it's after hours or on a weekend to give them good news, and they will be extraordinarily grateful, and they will pass along that information to their friends and coworkers. In addition, if you're new in town, a personal phone call to potential referral sources pays off huge. And even if you're established, there's no better way to get the word out about your new skill set or services than to make a quick call and take the opportunity to reintroduce yourself to your referring doctors, educate others on what you can do with the U.S. to help mutual patients. In fact, once they heard about my capabilities, radiologists started recommending EUS in their reports, which was an ongoing advertisement for my services and naturally increased referrals from other ordering physicians who I'd never met. And to that point, when I see a new doc's name as a referring doc, I try to personally call after the procedure, which has resulted in ongoing referrals for other consults and other GI procedures in addition to them even telling other physicians and partners about EUS when appropriate. So this process of communication really pays it forward from all aspects and allows rapid information sharing for care coordination. However, there are going to be some docs that don't want to take time away from their practice to take your call in the middle of the day, and they will absolutely let you know that, which is completely understandable. Therefore, take the opportunity to harness technology the times 
Use secure text messaging applications if you have an integrated electronic medical record system, and you can streamline communication and care process tremendously without picking up the phone. Outside of giving periodic lectures, educating your community from a marketing standpoint is something you're never taught to do as a physician. However, there's no substitute for marketing yourself, being visible and approachable, and pounding the pavement. Partner with your community hospital's marketing team and your practice manager to spread the word, especially if you have a website. Capitalize on rallies or benefits for certain GI cancers like November, which is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Donate your time and sponsorship. Volunteer to be a spokesperson where discussions regarding your community hospital's EUS services are extremely appropriate. Tell people, now we have a weapon against this horrible disease. Local TV news will often have health segments. And early in my practice, I was able to get five minutes to discuss the addition of the U.S. to our community. And this was an informative and a great advertising piece that many referring docs and patients saw. When marketing EUS to your colleagues, tumor board is very high yield because there are numerous instances where you can offer assistance with biopsies or staging that others may not have even considered. And if you don't have a tumor board at your facility, endoscopic ultrasound as well as your partnership with pathology gives you a great foundation to build that tumor board and make it very successful moving forward. Medical staff meetings are great opportunities to speak for a few minutes through a concentrated space of clinical referral sources as well as key administrative allies. Historically, these can be very bland meetings and EUS is probably the most exciting thing they've heard of in years. In addition, I took my laptop and went to docs offices, oncologists, surgeons, PCPs, as well as radiologists, and actually conducted small group lectures where I showed them videos of actual EUS cases I'd done on their specific patients to help them understand what an amazing tool EUS provides. Many of them had no idea this technology even existed, and some of them even thought that E and EUS stood only for esophagus and had no idea of its incredible utility elsewhere in the body. Even morning reports for house staff were of significant benefit because I could put EUS in the center of their radar screen for the physicians in training and received many inpatient referrals from the teaching services thereafter. And as an aside, my endo unit often has nursing students and house school outreach programs, so I always encourage them to come into my room to expose them, and they actually spread the word quite successfully to their fellow students. In addition to educating their community, EUS practitioners have a passion for challenge and make a commitment to mastering new techniques, equipment innovations, and evolving indications as EUS expands its utility into other disease states. A quote that came to mind in preparing this webinar was by Socrates, who said, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. And I think that's very relevant to the ongoing commitment one makes to a successful EUS venture. Perseverance is absolutely necessary when introducing a new service to your community because local practices and referral patterns can change very slowly. When responding to a procedure request, it's important to learn when to say yes and how to appropriately say no. Embracing opportunities to challenge yourself and to do what you've trained to do is the best way to advertise your service through demonstrated practice. However, you will be asked to do procedures that you're not trained to handle or are even inappropriate, and there's no faster way to generate bad press than multiple complications from a new service line. For example, I commonly get asked to do ERCP on patients to evaluate a small pancreatic cyst. In a case like that, it's important to pick up the phone and communicate with your referring doc. Tell him or her that EUS is a better test, it's safer, the ability to gain more information, and far less risky to the patient. On the other hand, you might get asked to perform high-level therapeutic EUS on a patient, and it's important to be honest. I don't do that procedure at this time, but I may expand into it in the future, and I appreciate you keeping me in mind. Territorial colleagues is something worth mentioning, and I found the best way to circumvent that is asking, how can I help your patients? And truthfully, what happens more often than not is radiologists are ecstatic to give up challenging and risky percutaneous pancreatic biopsies, and sometimes surgeons even want to give up intraoperative cholangiograms that add extra time and complexity to their surgeries. But if they don't, EUS is always there as a backup to provide additional information, and I tell them, I'm here to help, so call me if I can be of service. Schedule flexibility is sort of an oxymoron, but, but EUS providers should be flexible enough to add on cases but also proactive to build in time for EUS and associated duties like phone calls, correspondence, marketing, and administrative. Flexibility needs to extend to your spouse and family because they're going to have to be very supportive of your time away from home to add these cases on when they arise. 
In addition, that flexibility also extends to your partners because endoscopic ultrasound takes time away from bread and butter GI as well as your endo center, which may affect your practice in multiple ways, especially if your practice is vertically, vertically integrated with multiple associated income streams. My experience, though, is that partners are extraordinarily supportive because of the goodwill generated by U.S. and may opt to give up ERCP, in, in some cases especially potential diagnostic ERCP, due to the new availability of U.S. As a general rule, I try to respond to referrals within two business days and perform the procedure within one business week from the time I re re receive the referral. However, as an U.S. practitioner gets busier, a common scenario is trying to accommodate sicker patients, someone who's acutely jaundiced with concern for malignancy, over a patient with stable, less con concerning pathology, like a tiny pancreatic cyst that's been stable for years. In that case, I always take the time to communicate with the referring docs as well as the patient, and both almost always understand waits over one week with the proper communication. The worst case scenario, I've had to add people onto my office if they're worried about waiting so that they have time to ask questions, and they understand at that point that there's an urgency to address their issue, but not an emergency. Once successful implementation of the U.S. into your community hospital and GUI practice has occurred, these qualities add to your portfolio of services. Again, this is a feather in your cap compared to other community centers and general GI practices, and this is the time to harvest the fruits of your coordinated community efforts. In financial terms, portfolio is the collection of your investments, and a successful, robust portfolio combines consistency, growth, and diversification. Many of you have probably heard the story making the online rounds over the last year about a professor lecturing to students a jar is placed in front of the classroom, which is supposed to represent a person's life and then filled with rocks. The professor asks if the jar is full, and the students say yes. So the professor pours pebbles into the jar, which find additional space between the rocks. The professor asks if the jar is full, and the students say yes. So the professor pours sand into the jar, which finds further space between the pebbles and the rocks. The professor asks if the jar is full, and the students laugh and say yes. So the professor pours water into the jar, which fills it up to the top. Now this is supposed to be a representation of how you can always find additional ways to fill your life using relationships, work, family, religion, volunteer work, hobbies, and other things of importance. In addition, it's also an exercise in priorities because if you sweat all the small details, like the water, sand, and pebbles get put in your jar first, then there isn't any room for the big rocks in your life. When I heard this message, I saw a lot of parallels to what EUS has meant to my practice and likely to other community-based gastroenterologists. I looked at my jar, which represented my medical practice, and I saw it filled with big jars, which was the bread and butter GI I practiced day to day. However, I soon started filling my jar with pebbles of EUS work, which were my pancreatic biliary evaluations. Then as more referrals came in, came the sand, which were the submucosal lesions and the tumor staging. And again, further referrals came in, which was finally the water, the interventional EUS procedures. After I was done, I realized I had a satisfying practice that was full of variety and full of challenge to carry throughout the rest of my years and future practice needs and desires. In addition, if my future interests and priorities changed and I wanted to focus more on EUS, I could fill my jar with the pebble, sand, and water first and rely less on the big rocks of general GI. So all in all, my EUS training in my community hospital's amazing support has yielded tremendous flexibility and marketability to ensure our services remain in high demand long term. With that, I'll hand the reins back to Amanda, who will proctor our Q&A session. Again, I want to thank Olympus for this incredible opportunity to share my experiences and direction with each of you. We'll now move on to the question and answer portion of this afternoon's presentation. Our first question is from Beth. Beth asks, how important are pathology and anesthesia to a successful EUS program? Thanks, Beth, for your question. Uh, once EUS has been implemented, pathology and anesthesia, in my mind, are two of the most important partners to a successful EUS program. At my center, I'm lucky enough to have ROSE, which I mentioned during my presentation, which is that rapid on-site evaluation, and in-room pathology, as well as a group of very highly trained anesthesiologists. So having a great level of trust in these departments helps me to concentrate on the task at hand when I'm caring for very complex patients 
and disease state. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Landison. Uh, our next question comes from John. John asks, how long did it take for your staff to feel comfortable with EUS as a procedure? Well, thanks, John, for your question. That's, that's a great question. You know, actually, at my, at my first position, the nurses took initiative to travel all the way to my fourth year institution where they got to train with some of the finest nurses and endoscopy technicians in the world. Uh, they learned all the tricks of the trade and kind of the behind the scenes uh, things that would happen, and they were able to take these lessons back to their facility where they hit the ground running once they started on day one. After I formally started, though, it took my staff about two weeks to get over the initial new procedure jitters, uh, but I took advantage of my clinical support provided by Olympus and brought in my local clinical application specialist to work with the staff in the room. In addition, the endoscopy service specialist worked with my reprocessing staff to ensure that everyone was comfortable with that minor change that came with that in the U.S. to my hospital. Thanks. Laura asks, what kind of scope mix do you recommend for a new program starting out? Laura, it, it really depends on how you were trained. Uh, the way I was trained with my chief was start with a radio exam and proceed to linear once a biopsy or intervention is required. Or if you can't see the area of interest with a radial scope, then you uh, bring in the linear scope for a second look. Uh, now, nowadays, I know there are many docs who just use linear exams for both diagnostic and therapeutic indications. Uh, but again, I feel most comfortable with the way in which I was trained and feel like I could get a more complete exam that way. Uh, when I started, though, I, I had one radial and one linear scope. And that allowed me to do about four cases over a six-hour day uh, due to scope reprocessing and patient recovery time. But as my volume grew, we were blessed enough to expand to two radial and two linear scopes, which is what we have now. And that's actually allowed me to double uh, my case volume. Great. We have a question from Jeffrey next. How did you build interdepartmental relationships to gain a referral? Developing these relationships is it's paramount to having a successful program. Uh, when I started the program, I attended multiple department and staff meetings to present what EUS was, what it could do for the hospital as well as our patients, uh, and, and what we could do to, to help the overall community. Uh, it was important for me to convey to the different departments that I wasn't looking to take patients away from them, rather to, I was looking to be a part of the team and taking care of our patients. And I was surprised how motivated other specialties were to integrate EUS into their, into their decision making. Uh, after really they understood the multitude of ways EUS could serve our patients and also the rapidly expanding therapeutic indications of the technology. Thanks, Dr. Landisman. Uh, Fayez asked, do you need a cancer center in order to realize downstream revenue from EUS? Oh, that's a great question, Fayez. No, in my experience, having a cancer center is not required, but having access to oncology imaging, pathology, radiology, and surgery, as I mentioned during my presentation, will give you the best chance at downstream revenue. And even if you don't have all those departments or just a few, I think you can still glean significant benefit. The main benefits of a cancer center are the ability to keep patients in your network, as well as being a referral center from that catchment area I referenced earlier. Great answer. Thank you very much. We have another question from Zach. He asks, how do you monitor patient satisfaction? I'm very, very lucky that follow-up calls are made to each of the patients undergoing an EUS by our staff. Uh, but I try to take it a step further. And if there's a cancer diagnosis, I try to be very upfront if I've received that information during the procedure by the rapid on-site evaluation. And then when I get confirmation that that is the true diagnosis, I try to make those difficult calls personally to let them know. And I think that helps the patient realized I have their best interest at heart and want to be an integral part of their support team moving forward. Uh, but in addition, our unit and hospital conduct patient surveys through the mail on a regular basis. Thanks, Dr. Landison. We have one final question today, and it's from Xavier. He asks, I want to gain more practical experience in EUS. Where could I go for more? There are actually several U.S. practical courses that happen each year. Uh, I've attended courses put on by Olympus in the past that have been very beneficial. They have a combined didn'tic as well as a hands-on curriculum, so you get a nice mix of the classroom learning plus the, 
uh, the hands-on representation. And the ASGE, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, puts on similar courses in Chicago and during most of the major events like DDW as well as ACG. Thank you. And I told a little fib, I have one more question for you. Uh, Lynn asks, how beneficial is offering EUS at an ASC? That's a good question. You know, we talked about that within our practice. The challenge is, is that the upfront cost uh, is counterbalanced, as I mentioned during my lecture, by the downstream revenue. When you have that within an ASC, I guess depending on who the owners are, you have maybe a variable amount of ability to capture some of that downstream revenue depending on how integrated your practice is. So at this time, we've decided to just maintain ours within the hospital. And in addition, you know, the other point is, is that uh, diagnosis, diagnostic, ER, uh, diagnostic endoscopic ultrasound uh, may be uh, one of the, the ways in which you use it in the ASC, not having, rap, not having rapid on-site evaluation, uh, as well as potentially doing therapeutic procedures, doing biopsies where there could be risk for bleeding, might be an additional, uh, an additional way in which ASC EUS might be a little bit more dangerous. So that's what we've uh, decided to keep at the hospital as well. Thank you for those answers and for providing an excellent presentation, Dr. Landisman. Attendees, please contact your Olympus Endoscopic Area Manager with any questions we might not have gotten to. If you don't know who that is, feel free to contact us via our website, medical.olympusamerica.com.